The uprising in Poland had been planned for a long time. From the very beginning of the war and the appearance of the Nazis in the country, Warsaw residents were preparing for another armed struggle. The Germans took over the capital of Poland, but Warsaw never really gave up. Poles did not have their country for too long. They could not lose it again. Thus, home army soldiers hiding in Warsaw were waiting for an order to commence the fights. But the order did not come. Thousands of people ready for the uprising lived in chaos and disinformation. Varsovians were motivated to fight. They also had a certain amount of weapons, which, given the element of surprise, gave hope for a successful fight against the Nazis. Meanwhile, more and more people died day after day in the streets of the occupied Polish capital. Infirmity and stagnation aroused rage in home army soldiers who were waiting for a signal to fight. They had to watch the Germans line up and shoot their loved ones, family, friends, and acquaintances. They were soldiers. They swore to obey orders. Some were ready to start the uprising arbitrarily, but they decided not to do it. So the question arises, what were the headquarters of the Home Army waiting for? Why were they delaying the start of the uprising, despite the fact that time worked in their favor? And the Germans began to withdraw from the capital, which meant that their strength was extremely limited. The Home Army headquarters wanted to make sure that this was the right moment, that the uprising had a chance of success. Unfortunately, certainty never came, so they waited further for the Red Army. Why did the Varsovians decide to start the uprising at all? If the German troops were withdrawing from Poland in fear of the approaching Red Army, why take the risk in a situation where it would seem that the worst was over? The plan was simple. Soviet soldiers entered the city controlled by Poles who, represented by the authorities of the Polish underground state, welcomed them as hosts. This was to show the supremacy of the Polish Underground State Command over the Polish Committee of National Liberation, established with the support of the Soviets, and to ensure a political advantage during the rebuilding of the Polish state. As we know from today's perspective, this plan unfortunately failed completely. However, it was known that a lonely fight against Germany could not be successful, even in favorable circumstances. Therefore, it was decided that the uprising would begin a few days before the Red Army entered Warsaw, which would support Poles in getting rid of, according to the assumption, losing Germans. The mere threat of Soviet troops entering the battle with the Poles was to significantly weaken the Wehrmacht's morale. Finally, in the last days of July, information appeared on the streets of the city that the Russians had reached the vicinity of Warsaw. The Home Army headquarters issued the long-awaited order signed by General Tadeusz Bor Komorowski. On August the 1st, 1944, at 5 p.m., the W hour came. The largest liberation uprising in occupied Europe and the great tragedy of tens of thousands of people. This decision meant that Warsaw would never be the same as before. The worst was yet to come. The Russians did not enter Warsaw. They cynically awaited its complete fall, which was Stalin's plan from the very beginning. Poles wanted to trick the Soviets, using the Red Army to strengthen their position in the future structures of reborn Poland, and ultimately they ended up tricked and exploited. Stalin decided to enter when the battle was over, enter the city which certainly would not put up any resistance. On the first day, 25,000 to 36,000 guerrillas stood up to fight. It is difficult to determine the exact number today. They had 1,000 rifles and not many more guns at their disposal. Ammunition were supposed to be enough for a few days of fighting. After all, according to the original plan, after a few days, the uprising was to end with the entry of the Red Army. The insurgents had serious difficulties with communication. Despite the long waiting period and months of planning, or maybe because of them, they were dramatically unprepared. Difficulties arose with the access to the hidden weapon storage, which meant that at the beginning of the fighting, the insurgents had less than half of the already modest arsenal at their disposal. Initially, there were definitely less Germans than the Home Army soldiers, about 16,000. 
The Wehrmacht forces were retreating through Warsaw after a humiliating defeat on the front, but the city itself was to be defended. However, they did not lack weapons. They also had tanks, planes, and all possible tools to facilitate the extermination of the population. The disproportion of strength was unimaginable. And so the Varsovians ended up alone, unarmed, unorganized, forgotten, and used in the most cynical way. The Russians had no mercy and waited for Warsaw to fall. The Germans had no mercy either and responded to the armed uprising with all their strength. It was the end of the city that Warsaw citizens knew. During the uprising, which lasted for 63 days, the residents of Warsaw tried to arrange their lives in a new, strange and terrifying reality. The voices of the street were divided. Some expressed enthusiasm. Some were terrified. One can speak about the uprising and its reality for a long time. Ultimately, the terrifying scale of the uprising must be analyzed. The uprising took the lives of up to 180,000 civilians who were not related to the activities of the Home Army or the Polish underground state, and about 16,000 insurgents who were killed in the fights alone. At Hitler's order, over 70% of the city was completely destroyed. And although the uprising became a symbol of hope, heroism and steadfastness, it cannot be denied that it ended in catastrophe. And let the number witness the catastrophe. In one of the districts of Warsaw, named Wola, more than 12 tons of ashes remaining after the burning bodies of fallen Warsaw residents were collected, 